Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk. This is part four on challenges in the evaluation of the spleen, which as we've looked at in the first three parts of the series is indeed a challenge. Now, last time we asked the question, what processes involve the liver and spleen? Sometimes perhaps you can figure out what the splenic lesion is by looking at other organs. So things to think about lymphoma, which can involve multiple organs, liver, spleen, kidneys, pancreas, as well as extensive adenopathy. Metastatic melanoma is a good one for involving both liver and spleen. Other mets, including renal cell, can potentially do it. Infection, especially immunosuppressed patients. You think of candidiasis as the classic multiple tiny splenic lesions, as well as lesions commonly in the liver and also occasionally in the kidney. And then, of course, sarcoidosis, which is a classic mimicker of lymphoma and involves the liver and the spleen uh, not uncommonly. And here's a good example of sarcoid. My first look at this, if the patient was febrile, would be lymphoma. If the patient um, was immunosuppressed, eh, the lesions are too large for infection. I would say tumor. But in an incidental patient, meaning this patient had a CT scan for trauma, very mild trauma, Everyone went, oh my God, what is this lesion? And I've seen this numerous times. Sarcoidosis commonly involves the liver and spleen, but usually without focal lesions. When it does give focal lesions, it can give extensive lesions and very much look just like lymphoma. Sometimes sarcoid only involves the spleen, as you can see very nicely in this example, with at best one tiny liver lesion. And here's that same patient in coronal projection. Now, sarcoid really can involve the spleen very extensively. As I mentioned, most commonly it's simply splenomegaly, but multiple splenic lesions, and you could imagine why you could think about lymphoma. Sarcoid is a great mimicker, and whether it's the chest or the abdomen, and specifically the spleen, and occasionally the liver, you could be thinking about lymphoma. Just some statistics, we know sarcoid, African Americans are affected three times more commonly, Pulmonary complications are the most common cause of death, pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension, and symptoms include fatigue, fever, and weight loss, though sometimes patients are asymptomatic. In the abdomen, the liver, spleen, kidneys are all involved at times. Lymph nodes, bowel, and stomach can also be involved. In this article, sarcoid can affect all organs of the body. Its manifestations are nonspecific, and again, the challenge symptoms can look very much like lymphoma. Imaging reveals splenic involvement in up to 33% of patients with sarcoid, although the prevalence of splenic involvement is between 24 and 59% when systematic histological analysis is performed, or even up to 77% in autopsy series. Splenic sarcoid is generally manifested by homogeneous splenomegaly that is present in 40% of patients and rarely by focal splenic lesions, which again explains why the splenic lesions at times can be the great mimicker. Similarly, the liver can have very high involvement with sarcoid. Most of the time, it's simply going to be just the liver being enlarged, while other times you can imagine what the process will be with focal lesions present as well. Now, when you think about the spleen with sarcoid and the spleen with lymphoma, when you start seeing multiple lesions, you really have to have some concern about what you're dealing with. And although you think about lymphoma, think about sarcoid. Now, what else can give you involvement of the spleen? Um, things like thalassemia, things like sickle cell disease. Here's a wonderful example of beta thalassemia. You see the bony changes in the spine, this extra medullary hematopoiesis seen on the undersurface of the sacrum. So thalassemia is a really nice example. Things with extra medullary hematopoiesis can also give you an enlarged spleen. The spleen is one of the sites of extra medullary hematopoiesis. The commonest sites of extra medullary hematopoiesis in the abdomen are liver, spleen, and lymph nodes all sites of in utero hemopoietic activity. Signs and symptoms include hepatosplenomegaly and abdominal discomfort. So this is a very nice article on extramedullary hematopoiesis. Now, we are gonna talk about things like um, 
the spleen in cases of sickle cell disease where the spleen is small and autoinfarcted. But first, let's look at some of the things that we tend to overlook. What about vascular pathology? In the spleen, think about the splenic artery, or even within the spleen, you can have aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms. Most of the time, aneurysms are incidental findings, while pseudoaneurysms more commonly present with symptoms. Splenic artery aneurysms are the third most common intra-abdominal aneurysm. Think hepatic artery is first. Frequency between 0.2 and 10%. It's more common in women, usually due to pregnancy, but it's more likely to rupture in men. Splenic artery aneurysms are associated with things like atherosclerosis, hypertension, portal hypertension, cirrhosis, pregnancy, and liver transplantation. Pseudoaneurysms, the classic is pancreatitis. Repeated episodes of pancreatitis wear on the patient's splenic artery. You can also see it with trauma, post-op complications, and peptic ulcer disease. We've seen it as a complication of distal pancreatectomies or even Whipple's procedures. The classic presentation with pseudoaneurysm of the splenic artery, abdominal pain, melana, hematemesis, pseudoaneurysms rupture in up to 37% of cases and when you have a rupture, mortality can approach 90% unless early diagnosis is made. Here's a nice example of a splenic artery aneurysm, about one centimeter. Typically, under two centimeters, no one's going to do anything about the aneurysm. Over two centimeters, you may see coil embolization. And when they get really large, you can see surgical resection. Here's a patient with portal hypertension. You see the splenic aneurysm in the hilum of the spleen. Here's another case with a very tortuous splenic artery, redundant, and here's a splenic artery aneurysm with calcification. The presence of calcification doesn't mean a whole lot. Sometimes the entire aneurysm is calcified. Other times it's only partially calcified. That does not have an impact in terms of frequency of rupture, although one might think if it was totally calcified, it'd be less likely to rupture. Now, one of the things to also look at when you have a patient with a splenic artery aneurysm, look carefully at all the vessels because concurrent aneurysms are not uncommon. This patient also had a GDA aneurysm, which is more likely to rupture and bleed. Splenic aneurysms can be really large. Here is almost a five centimeter splenic artery aneurysm. Here it is in 3D, very nicely shown. This aneurysm is so large, you're going to need surgical resection. Coiling is just not going to work. Coiling may give you more problems than it solves. With pseudoaneurysms, this patient had back pain, was very lucky. You can see the pseudoaneurysm present with bleeding around the pseudoaneurysm. Fortunately, this patient was treated before this pseudoaneurysm ruptured further, and then the patient would have sanguinated. This was secondary to prior episodes of pancreatitis, very nicely shown in this example. So again, you want to look very carefully in all cases at the splenic artery. In cases of pancreatitis, you particularly want to look carefully at the splenic artery, make sure it's not developing a pseudoaneurysm. And again, as I mentioned, it's usually not the first episode of pancreatitis. It's usually patients with multiple episodes of pancreatitis. And these are the similar to the patients who get pancreatic pseudocysts from pancreatitis. It's repeated episodes of pancreatitis, not the first episode. Here's another patient who was exercising, collapsed. When they went to the hospital, had an emergency TCT, they saw blood, but no pseudoaneurysm. What actually happened, I saw the scans. In retrospect, even, you couldn't see it, but I think from the blood, the pseudoaneurysm was compressed. The patient came to Hopkins. We had a repeat CT. It was several weeks later. Now you see the large pseudoaneurysm, which was eventually embolized. You can see some of the blood and inflammation around the pseudoaneurysm. This patient indeed was very lucky. And here's a few more views of that in the coronal perspective. Now I mentioned about splenic arteries with calcification. It's not uncommon. Uh, again, uh, calcification uh, does not change the total outcome. The lesions can still enlarge. Though, as I noted, patients with 360 degrees of calcification, maybe those lesions are less likely to have problems. Now, we speak about splenic infarction. We speak about that like we speak about renal infarcts. It can be segmental, 
which is most common, single or multiple areas in the spleen are involved, or we could speak about global involvement, where the entire spleen is involved, and that's more commonly due to trauma. Splenic infarcts can be due to bacterial endocarditis, commonly with atrial fib, sickle cell disease, lymphoma, and splenomegaly. The classic appearance is wedge-shaped areas of decreased attenuation, which can change over time. They can retract over time and cause scarring in the splenic capsule. Infarcts of the spleen are not uncommon as a complication from surgery. This was a patient with a Whipple's procedure, but you can see as a post-op complication, the patient has near total infarction of the spleen. This is a nice example showing you with infarction, there's a lack of enhancement, which you can see nicely here, and here as well on the 3D images. And again, there's near total infarct, except for the lower portion of the patient's spleen. Now here's a patient with adenocarcinoma of the pancreas with recurrence. Patient also has a splenic infarct. About half the spleen is involved. So anything that involves the pancreas, particularly if you're doing surgical intervention, can lead to splenic infarction. Uh, one of the complications we always worry about is splenic infarction. And then surely in the post-op patient, you worry about splenic infarction leading to splenic abscess. That can indeed occur. And here's a real nice example on the 3D volume views of the splenic infarction. Okay, very nicely shown. Now, sickle cell disease, one of the classic things about SS disease is a very tiny spleen due to autoinfarction. Sometimes you can't even find the spleen unless you look really carefully, and then you see something linear and calcified a centimeter in size. SS disease gives the smallest spleens. Patients with thalassemia, I showed you a case a few moments back, was a very large spleen. Patients with sickle thalassemia can have a normal size spleen. Here's the classic sickle cell disease, dense calcification. Here's another example, really nice case of autoinfarction of the spleen. Here the spleen has calcifications, but is small, but not as small as in the other cases. And here it is on the coronal view as well. Now, splenic abscess is relatively rare, but potentially fatal. Risk factors for splenic abscess, diabetes, alcoholism, and these days, IV drug abuse. It can be a complication of surgery. The typical abscess is low density, can have some rim enhancement, but it's often irregular. Less than 20% of splenic abscesses have air within them, which means if you need air to make the diagnosis, you're going to miss 80% of splenic abscesses. Most of the time, splenic abscesses are pretty easy to recognize, surely with the clinical history, though other times they can simulate cysts or cystic tumor or infarct or even hemorrhage. I think the tumor that can be most challenging is lymphoma. Often lymphoma, when it's infiltrating in focal areas, can present clinically as well as imaging-wise looking like a splenic abscess. Now, pyogenic splenic abscesses are most often due to hematogenous spread of infection. Again, risk factors, diabetes, immunosuppression, corticosteroid therapy, and sickle cell disease. Abscesses present usually with pain as well as fever, particularly in the left upper quadrant. And as we mentioned, splenic abscesses can be solitary, multiple, or multiloculated. Here's a good example, cystic, low density, irregular margins. If you told me this wasn't a splenic abscess, I would have to say lymphoma. But with the right history, this is a splenic abscess till proven otherwise. This was an unusual patient who was in a government facility working with some unusual organisms who developed a splenic abscess. You can see air bubbles within the spleen. I believe this was Yersinia. Patients who are immunosuppressed, bone marrow transplant, multiple tiny liver lesions, multiple tiny splenic lesions. You got to think about aspergillosis. Occasionally you think about candidiasis. They can look very similar. Often it's only the spleen, but in many cases there's spleen and liver and occasionally spleen, liver, and kidney, a very classic case. The first case I was ever quizzed on on a film panel was by Gary Glazer, may he rest in peace, 
when he was head of CT at University of Michigan, and he showed me a case of aspergillosis of the spleen. I think he was giving me an easy case so I would get something right. Here's a good example of candidiasis involving the liver and the spleen. But again, the clinical history makes it easy. Immunosuppressed patient, bone marrow transplant, splenic, and liver lesions allow you to make the diagnosis. And since you often have old scans, you'll see that the lesions are new. Now, candidiasis presents as multiple focal lesions that are small and rounded, hypochoic on ultrasound, and minimally enhancing at best on CT. So a very, very nice diagnosis. Um, we started off with this quote by Seward. In conclusion, in patients with an incidental splenic mass identified at imaging, and with the absence of a history of malignancy, fever, weight loss, or pain, such masses are likely to be benign regardless of their appearance. And makes the point that you don't need to have very impressive workups. But you can see from the cases we've gone through, history becomes very, very important. If you have fever, that lesion is important. Those cases I showed you were all going to be abscesses. Again, most lesions are benign, but not all lesions are benign. So summarizing, lesion detection is critical, of course, but then with the spleen, the biggest challenge for us is definition and determining what the lesion actually is. Clinical history is important. Imaging findings are important. Again, without looking at the lesion, statistically, it's going to be benign, but that's easy to say on a film panel. When you're dealing with a patient in the real world, you're trying to think about what am I dealing with? Is this an abscess? Is this a leave alone benign nothing? Or is it metastasis or lymphoma? So again, go through many of the things we reviewed. Think about the cases I showed you. And I think when you do that, you'll do a wonderful job. Hopefully you won't be operating on a lot of cases that don't need to be operated on or biopsying cases that don't need to be biopsied. But again, it is a challenging thing and it's always easy in retrospect to come up with the right diagnosis. And with that, let me stop there and thank everybody for their attention. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.